This is a short video on the mechanism of disease for pulmonary embolism. We'll be talking about these core concepts for the pathophysiology of pulmonary embolism, and they'll be color corded according to this key up here. We'll be working through the risk factors of pulmonary embolism, the pathophysiology of how those risk factors contribute to the disease, the actual disease process, and the manifestations or the signs and symptoms of pulmonary embolism. Let's get started. The risk factors can be grouped into three categories. The first category is inherited disorders, and that's genetic disorders including factor V Leiden and prothrombin gene mutation. If the risk factor isn't inherited, it's acquired, and these can be further broken down into provoking and non-provoking acquired risk factors. Examples of provoking risk factors are recent surgery or trauma, immobilization, new hormone therapy, and active cancer. Some non-provoking risk factors or passive risk factors are obesity and cigarette smoking. In some way or another, these risk factors all contribute to Virchow's triad, which consists of venous stasis, endothelial injury, and the patient being in a hypercoagulable state. These inherited genetic disorders contribute to a hypercoagulable state. The non-provoking passive risk factors like obesity and cigarette smoking contribute a pr pr a pretty distributed equally to um, Virchow's triad. For instance, obesity can mean that you're, being st uh, you're sitting still, you're not moving, um, and obesity is also a hypercoagulable state because of the high estrogen levels. Cigarette smoking is also a high estrogen state, and the nicotine and some of the chemicals in cigarettes can also directly cause um, endothelial injury as well. Recent trauma or surgery is a direct injury to the endothelium. Immobilization um, directly causes venous stasis, and hormone therapy and active cancer both contribute to a hypercoagulable state as well. In any case, Virchow's triad is well known to contribute to the generation of a thrombus, and the thrombus typically forms in the lower extremities, uh, the proximal region of the lower extremities, and the deep veins. These deep veins have thromboses, these DVTs then travel to the lungs, and the DVTs in the lungs then occlude the pulmonary arteries and or the pulmonary arterioles. The disease process kind of expands pretty broadly from here, so we'll work through it one section at a time. First, the DVT in the pulmonary arteries can cause low perfusion in the pulmonary vasculature and parenchyma. This results in hypoxia inducing increased pulmonary vascular resistance. Remember that when you have hypoxia in the lungs, the body's response is to decrease the amount of blood that gets to that section um, of the lung as to not waste your um, inhalation, as to not waste the oxygen in your breath. So if you're going to vasoconstrict, you'll have pulmonary vascular resistance in that section. If you have high pulmonary vascular resistance, that results in a decreased left ventricular preload, um, and the right ventricle will become overloaded because it's hard to pump forward from the right ventricle when you have increased pulmonary vascular resistance. The result here is that your cardiac stroke volume is decreased and your cardiac output is decreased, and this directly causes hypotension. Further, if you have hypotension and a decreased cardiac output, you're going to activate the baroreceptors in the rest of the body. And when the baroreceptors detect that there's low blood pressure, they'll stimulate an adrenergic response that then triggers tachycardia. So your blood pressure will be low and your heart rate will be high. The low perfusion in the pulmonary vasculature also contributes to lung tissue ischemia and infarction. And of course, whenever you have ischemia or infarction, you'll result in inflammatory mediators. You'll also get inflammatory mediators from congestion in the pulmonary vascular beds. This congestion can result in pulmonary edema, which is static fluid, also contributes to inflammatory mediators. These inflammatory mediators do a few other things. Firstly, they can irritate the pleural lining in the distal portions of the lung, and in the pleural, there'll be plenty of irritation. The pain receptors in the parietal pleura then transmit afferent signals back to the brain. Remember that afferent means toward the central nervous system. So this will go through a series of nerves, the phrenic and the intercostal nerves, then to the spinal cord, then to the spinothalamic tract, to the thalamus, and then the cerebral cortex. The patient will interpret this as pleuritic chest pain. In addition, the inflammatory mediators also trigger some chemico and mechanosensory receptors lining the airway. 
Um, this, in addition to the mucus secreted from the inflammatory mediators, result in efferent signals. Um, th these are signals that are being sent away from the CNS. And these go to the diaphragm, the pharynx, the intercostal muscles, and the neck muscles. And this coordinated movement of all those muscle groups results in the cough. So the patient will also have cough. Lastly, the congestion in the pulmonary vascular beds results in a ventilation perfusion mismatch, also called a VQ mismatch. This results in some respiratory gas dysregulation. The patient will have a low pH that's resulting from the high PCO2, that's a high retention of carbon dioxide. And because you're not perfusing and ventilating well, you will also have a low PACO2. This by definition is hypoxia. And when a patient has hypoxia, the peripheral sensory receptors detect it and the CNS, the central nervous system, is triggered to increase the respiration, to activate respiration. This results in an increased work of breathing, and the patient might feel this as dyspnea, or shortness of breath. That's it for this mechanism of disease map for pulmonary embolism. I hope it was helpful, and thank you for listening.